I'm Lisa Pullman. I'm the Executive Director at the Natural Resources Council of Maine. I'm so glad that you're here. On June 2nd, the Obama administration, through the Environmental Protection Agency, took the single biggest step to date to address climate change. Finally, our federal government will be setting limits on the amount of carbon dioxide that the nation's power plants can put into the air. Power plants are the largest single source of carbon pollution. They have been freely emitting carbon for over a century, and that is contributing to climate change. Finally, as a nation, we are recognizing that climate change is real. Carbon pollution is helping to drive it. It's harming our environment, our health, and our future. Now, Maine and Vermont are warming faster than all the rest of the states, and that's because the Arctic Sea is melting. That's changing the temperature of the airflow coming our way. And this warming uh, is harming our nature-based industries like fisheries. It's creating more severe weather events that destroy coastal properties and wreak havoc on state infrastructure like bridges and railroads. It's increasing health threats like asthma and Lyme disease. And it's putting our treasured wildlife at risk like brook trout and moose. We have a moral obligation to our kids and our grandkids to move in a different direction so that the Maine we love is there for them. We need to shift how we produce energy and learn to use it more efficiently. Now, big shifts like this are tough, but we've already started in Maine. We know that we can work together to solve environmental and economic problems as big as climate change. We know that cleaner energy creates business opportunities for Maine. We were the first state in the nation to create a climate action plan. We, we are one of nine northeastern states to put limits on carbon pollution from our region's power plants, going all the way back to 2009 with the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI. REGI has been a win-win all along. And these new EPA rules will just help the rest of the states catch up to us in the Northeast. So the purpose of our meeting today is to have Kurt Spaulding and his staff provide an overview of these new rules and then to hear your thoughts about them. Let me welcome Curtis Spaulding, who is the regional administrator for Region 1 EPA. They're based in Boston. Oh, uh, first of all, it's great to be in Maine. And thank you for this opportunity. Um, just to reiterate, this is an unofficial uh, dialogue with me regarding this, the clean power plan, but I welcome the dialogue. It's important, and it's important that you all are, are all here. What I'm going to do is give you just a few minutes of, of overview of what the clean power plan is about. This rule is a never-before-done type of rule at, at EPA under an authority that's rarely used, what we call 111D. I don't think it's been used less than five times, I think, to, to handle uh, pollu air pollution problems. Um, so this is a very interesting, thoughtful approach to dealing with emissions from power plants or, or carbon emissions from power plants. This is what I typically call my donut slide, because it looks like a donut, with a little something orbiting around the outside. But the bottom line is, um, this speaks to where all the greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. come from. Um, big red circle about what we're regulating with this rule. We're regulating the, what we call electrical generating units, EGUs, or power plants. Now, power plants, as you can see, are the largest single source of carbon uh, pollution in, in the country. We will be working for a stepwise program uh, with goals that extend over a couple of decades with an expectation of a 30% reduction from 2005 levels by 2020. But what New England has shown is that doing this does not uh, cause economic challenges. In fact, it can enhance the economic vitality and prosperity of a place. Um, here in New England, you see the red line, which is total New England GDP. It's gone up 22% since 1999. And to forestall a question, I think that's real GDP, not, not uh, gross GDP. Um, you see the red 
I mean, sorry, the green line, which shows the reduction in carbon emissions. But I also want to bring the co-benefit lines to your attention. Those are NOx emissions and uh, SOx emissions, uh, SO2. We get these co-benefits with this rule, too, as we go forward, and, and Shih Tzu can talk a bit about that. But you'll see savings in your health care costs as you reduce risks of asthma and other pulmonary disease because of this reduction. So the President's Climate Action Plan had three primary components. Um, the first one, which is what we're talking about today, um, reducing carbon pollution from power plants. Um, second, preparing the United States for the impacts of climate change. And then also leading international efforts to address global climate change. So when the President issued his Climate Action Plan, um, he also directed EPA to use Clean Air Act Section 111 to develop carbon pollution standards, regulations, or guidelines as appropriate. So there's Section 111D, which is for existing sources, and 111B, which is for new, modified, and reconstructed sources. So under Section 111B, I know this gets a little <laughs> confusing, which is number one and two up here, um, EPA sets federal standards that sources need to meet. Um, so we propose standards for that. Um, we published that to the Federal Register for new power plants in January of this year. And then in June, we also proposed standards for modified and reconstructed sources, which we will be finalizing in a year. And what we're talking about today, number three, um, is under Section 111D of the Clean Air Act. So in that part of the Clean Air Act, what we do is EPA develops emissions guidelines, which states then use to develop state plans, and then those plans are tailored to their unique circumstances to address sources in their state. There's 120 days. Um, that comment period will be closing on October 16 of 2014. So whether you just go to this link or even just search Clean Power Plan, it should take you there. Um, and on the right side, there's a little box in orange, and it's, it says Get Involved. And in that box, you can click a link that says How to Comment. Good morning. My name is Tom Titenberg, uh, and I'm the Mitchell Family Professor of Economics Emeritus at Colby College. Uh, since 1990, my research agenda has focused mainly on the design and evaluation of climate policies. Given that background, I'm here to say thank you, EPA, for proposing not only a very intelligent and effective plan, but also an absolutely essential one. A few years ago, I had the privilege of participating in a National Academy of Sciences study entitled America's Climate Choices. I'd like to share a couple of insights that I took away from that experience. One, if we do not cut carbon emissions now, particularly from power plants, the largest single emission source, it becomes much more difficult, if not impossible, to protect ourselves from the worst ravages of climate change. The window of opportunity is closing. The time to act is now. Two, delays expose us not only to higher risks, but also higher costs. Taking action to mitigate emissions from power plants is much cheaper strategy than inaction. Inaction results in more emissions, and every additional ton of unmitigated emissions makes extreme weather more likely, intensifies droughts and wildfires in some areas, floods in others, introduces new threats to human health, and jeopardizes key ecosystems, including lobsters. The flexibility embedded by the Clean Power Plan allows states to mitigate emissions very efficiently. We know this because our own REGI system, which is compatible with this design, has not only achieved substantial emission reductions, but it has done so while boosting the economy and providing the means for businesses to lower their energy costs and become much more competitive. These economic benefits have several sources. First, most of the proceeds from selling the carbon allowances have been invested in weatherization and energy efficiency. These investments have allowed homeowners to increase the comfort levels in their homes while reducing both energy use and energy costs. We have also helped businesses reduce their energy costs. In fact, we've even found that firms facing the prospect of moving their production overseas from Maine have, as a result of these lower energy costs, been able to retain those facilities in Maine. The second economic benefit comes from the income which is retained in our state 
rather than shipped out to pay for oil. The third economic benefit flows from the fact that a whole new local vibrant industry of energy auditors, energy efficiency experts, and renewable resource companies has been created to help homeowners and businesses save money. The growth of this industry has meant the growth of jobs. And finally, since Maine is downwind from many polluting power sources, we especially will benefit from the reduced emissions of pollutants in addition to carbon, carbon which are also reduced by this plan. SO2, NOx, ozone, ozone, mercury, and small particulates. Since all of these pose health risks, this plan will make us healthier. In conclusion, thank you, EPA, for taking this significant first step to protect and preserve our economy and our families against this very significant threat. Good morning. Uh, my name is Lonnie Graham. I am a family practice physician, and I am the former chief public health officer for the state of Maine. And I'm here representing the Medical Association as well as Physicians for Social Responsibility to also offer our thanks for this forward step uh, towards uh, improving Maine's air. And I was very, very pleased to see in the initial presentation that health is one of the leading reasons for taking uh, these steps. And in fact, uh, the reduce, reduction in health care costs is seen as a significant benefit. And I absolutely agree with that. I think um, our members do that clean air is a tremendously important commodity for uh, the health of people. Uh, Maine people are actually currently dying from polluted air, which can trigger terminal attacks of asthma in children or heart attacks uh, in vulnerable elderly. Maine people are being hospitalized with health care problems such as asthma or emphysema, which might be treated at home if the uh, air was cleaner. Maine people are missing uh, school and work uh, because of uh, illnesses that are triggered by uh, polluted air. And um, for decades, uh, the Maine Medical Association and others uh, have tried to draw attention to the importance of this issue from a health perspective. But like uh, so many things that relate to prevention, it is very hard to see into the future and appreciate uh, the importance of this. The Clean Power Plan is a national strategy to address both the immediate, the immediate need of cleaner air and the long-term need to address climate change, which also has very significant health impacts. Uh, compliance with this plan will result in improved air quality in the near future, preventing premature deaths and reducing the need for hospitalization. Better air quality can translate to fewer missed work and school days. Um, and then looking further down in, into the future, climate change has been described as, and I quote from The Lancet, the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. The Clean Power Plan is a step toward addressing that imminent public health threat. Maine is already experiencing the health impacts of climate change in the form of advancing vector-borne diseases like Lyme disease, increasing high health, heat days, heavy rainstorms associated with contamination of water. Setting carbon standards is an essential step towards protecting Maine people from the serious health impacts of global climate change. Thank you. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here with so many people I've known for so many years. I'm Pam Pearson, a resident of Orland, a volunteer representing today the League of Women Voters of Maine. I've been an appointed member of the League of Women Voters of the United States Climate Change Task Force since it began in 2007. As you know and has been, has been said already, Maine has been a leader. The Reggie success has been spectacular. I was in Connecticut when they signed the New England Governor's Eastern Canadian Premier's Action Plan. What a day. I'm still getting goosebumps. Um, the benefits, the economic benefits. Tom Teitenberg helped me write a paper on the economic costs of not taking action. That was back in 2007. This is splendid. I'm really excited. So climate facts. 
I was also the UN, uh, the US chair of the Global Program of Action to Protect the Marine Environment from Land-Based Activities in the Gulf of Maine. You can only say that in 30 <laughs> seconds or less. So I've been really concerned about the ocean acidification issue. The higher CO2 levels are threatening our shellfish industry. That's $400 million a year. They held their first commission meeting last week. Our Gulf of Maine waters have seen some really weird species of fish in the last couple of weeks. I think you all heard about the grouper. Groupers in Florida. Katie did, usually in Massachusetts or south, was on our screen door last week. That's mid-coast Maine. Lyme disease, my 71-year-old friend came in the other day for lunch. She said, I've just been diagnosed with Lyme disease. Also her grandson. Iconic moose. Thousands of ticks on moose are just sucking them dead. I'm sorry, I really like moose, so I get really moved about that. My husband has asthma and COPD. He's elderly, plus has asthma. Not a good combination, I'll tell you. Extreme weather events, do you like your culverts being blown right out of the roads? No, thank you. That's what happened in Dover Foxcroft, I think it was this summer when we had that huge extreme weather event that was not a hurricane. Culverts cost millions. Other room over there, Esperanza Stanikoff and a couple of people from University of Maine did a thing, coastal communities, what are you interested in, in terms of climate change? The big deal was culverts because they don't know where they are. They only know that it's millions of dollars and washed out roadways. Um, sea level rise, storm surges. You know these people pay our taxes that support our schools. If all of a sudden those homes are washed out, where are we? So, Legal and Voters US strongly support the clean power plant. We believe that ta plan late. We believe that taking steps to reduce this greenhouse gas is essential to protect our children and future generations. The league, however, believes the APA proposal can and should be strengthened to better and more realistically recognize the potential for renewable energy and energy efficiency. So we think we, there need to be stronger standards. <coughs> So we applaud the EPA for the steps, but we think instead of 30 percent, it should be 35 percent by 2030. We also think speed is of the essence. No longer can we wait and think, gee, maybe it'll happen someday, this climate change. No, no, it's happening now. Uh, you've read the IPCC. You've read the National Climate Assessment. We all have. This is not new news anymore. So we think we, it should at least not allow any slippage in the current timetable or interim steps. Did you know that the American Council for Energy Efficient Economy found that the US ranked 13th in our energy efficiency programs behind Germany, China, India? Therefore, the League believes the EPA proposal should be strengthened for providing greater use of renewable energy and energy efficiency in displacing our carbon emissions. We don't think that some of the stuff used in the EPA plan really estimated accurately the potential for the use of renewable energy and to strengthen the state-by-state -state targets <coughs> accordingly. This is urgent. We know about the health risks. We know the we extreme weather. We know changes in the ocean. Maine has been a leader. We want to be, we are a leader still. We will continue to be a leader. So we urge you to not slip it. No way, no how. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Zach Anchors, and I'm the chair of the Voter Education Brigade. Um, it's a Portland based organization uh, with our aim is to promote civic engagement and to educate voters about the political process um, and about the, where the candidates and elected officials stand on, on various issues that we care about. And one of the issues we care most about um, is, is uh, climate change policy, um, because we believe that uh, climate change has already had a very significant impact on, on Maine um, and will continue in the, in the decades ahead in terms of, as many have mentioned already, uh, ocean acidification, rising sea levels, changing weather patterns. Um, so it's already having a big impact and will continue to on our, on our economy and our culture and our environment. Um, so for that reason, we're very enthusiastic about, about the EPA's Clean Power Plan and um, grateful for the opportunity to learn more about it. Um, 
And you know, our role when it comes to this topic, the, the voter education brigades role is, is really to educate the public um, about how climate change policy intersects with, with the political process. Um, and most importantly, um, our role is to work to push candidates and elected officials to, to fight for policies that will reduce emissions and create a more, a, a new, more sustainable um, energy paradigm for our country. Um, and, you know, regardless of the impact here in Maine, uh, we also just take very seriously the, the moral obligation um, as, as citizens of the country that pr produces a huge share of the world's emissions um, to, re to minimize the impact of climate change for, for those in other parts of the world where the impact will be actually much more severe and, and more disastrous. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's our sense that this plan is only going to be successful um, and accomplish what it's meant to, um, and that other steps that are even more ambitious to reduce carbon emissions are only going to be successful if uh, citizens really engage in the process and really push the elected officials and candidates to, uh, to support them and fight for them. Um, and so we're interested in finding more opportunities to do that and more opportunities for, uh, for our members and for the public to, to engage with this process. So thank you very much. Good morning, I'm Nick Batista. I work at the Island Institute um, as the Marine Programs Director. The Island Institute is a community development organization located in Rockland, Maine, and we work to sustain Maine's island and remote coastal communities. Uh, we work on a, a broad range of issues because there are many different aspects to what it, to, um, what it takes to sustain a community from schools to jobs to other ways to make a living, um, electricity, fuel, leadership, those are all areas where we have programming, and all of our programming is um, at least partially focused on climate change. Whether it's community-based energy efficiency or renewable energy programs that tap into the skills and enthusiasm of middle and high school students um, and community volunteers, or citizen science um, projects that, that leverage local, um, uh, sorry, citizen science projects that investigate <coughs> Um, local environmental change led collaboratively by elementary school students, fishermen and researchers, or um, local economic development and leadership programming that, um, that helps us prepare our communities for adapting to climate change and shifts in our, our economy that are coming. Um, all of these areas are impacted by climate change and we work on all of them. As the Marine Programs Director, um, I'm most familiar with the marine aspects of climate change and um, the, the impact, Maine's island and coastal communities are heavily dependent on our fisheries, primarily the lobster fishery, and Maine's island and coastal communities are extremely vulnerable to changing markets and climate conditions. I see climate change as one of the biggest threats to the long-term future of Maine's fishing communities. Sea level rise and warming waters um, threaten our working waterfront infrastructure and potentially the health of the species that our fisheries rely on. Many fishermen we work with want their children and grandchildren to be able to go fishing. If we don't address climate change, fishing as we know it may not be an option. Climate change will um, impact our, our working waterfront infrastructure through sea level rise, increased storm frequency and intensity. Um, those will both make it harder for communities to maintain their critical infrastructure for fishermen. Um, we'll see new species showing up like black sea bass and blue crabs. We've had reports of blue crabs up in mid-coast Maine already. They're normally found in Chesapeake Bay. Um, and we'll see the loss of other species like shrimp that are particularly sensitive to climate. In 2012, the waters of the Gulf of Maine were three to five degrees warmer than the long-term average. And for the preceding four years, water temperatures were also above the long-term average and increased each year. The warming of the Gulf of Maine caused lobsters to shed their shells five to six weeks before normal, causing a collapse in the price and widespread economic hardship. This year, the Gulf of Maine has um, cooled some and water temps are more in line with the long-term average. The shed this year in the mid-coast was about a week behind normal. Um, the difference in the timing of the shed caught a bunch of fishermen by surprise and also caused economic disruption because they were expecting an earlier shed because they'd gotten used to five years of, of having the shed happen earlier. Um, for most of the past hundred years, Maine lobstermen have proactively worked to ensure the long-term future and sustainability of, um, of their fishery, and 
They've done this through strong conservation measures like releasing egg-bearing female lobsters and oversized lobsters that are the future of the fishery. They've also um, invested heavily in marketing. They've invested $2 million recently in a new Maine Lobster Marketing Collaborative to promote the Maine Lobster brand. As Maine lobstermen and, and coastal communities work hard to ensure a fishery for the future, we need to work hard as a country and make sure that their efforts aren't um, in vain. Hi, my name is Mark Lozier. I'm a driver uh, of and an advocate of electric vehicles to reduce CO2. Carbon dioxide, as you well know, is a greenhouse gas produced by natural uh, processes and especially man's burning of those fossil fuels. The Keeling curve illustrated there um, is a measurement of the concentration of uh, carbon dioxide uh, taken uh, from Hawaii's Mauna Loa since 1958. Uh, this Scripps Oceanographic Institute carbon dioxide program was initiated by David Keeling uh, and is the longest continuously running measurement uh, in the world. Uh, it is often said a picture is worth a thousand words, so please see on the chart um, 350 parts per million uh, was reached in the mid 80s. Uh, 350 is the scientifically acknowledged level above which uh, damage is occurring to the environment. Uh, that was 30 years ago and all of the so-called efforts at mitigation, the Kyoto Protocol, which the United States signed but did not ratify, the Copenhagen Agreement, etc., has not made a dent in the inexorable rise of CO2. Since the data has been collected over the last 56 years, which is a nanosecond in geological time, the levels of CO2 has risen 28% and reached 400 parts per million last year. It should be noted that this graph shows a curve, <coughs> hence the name Keeling Curve, and it is indicative of acceleration. Uh, as well as increasing global temperatures, excess CO2, as previously been discussed, dissolves in our oceans, uh, which is um, harming Maine's ecology. We will be judged harshly by future generations for what we are doing to the Earth, um, and more so for what we are not. Um, when you write your reports after this trip to Maine and elsewhere, please use the words urgent in boldface and underline for we are not on a sustainable path. Good morning. I'm Joe Payne. I work for Friends of Casco Bay as Casco Baykeeper. Uh, Kurt, it's great to see you back in Maine. Welcome back. And uh, I wanted to note my own personal favorite part of your legacy at Save the Bay, and that is Kurt is the founder. I don't know how Lisa didn't mention this, but Kurt is the founder of the highly successful Narragansett Baykeeper program. So thank you still for that. I want to bring to your attention today some research that we're doing here in Casco Bay. We're very local. This is where we do our research. And we have found right now uh, clam flats in Casco Bay with pH levels so low that they dissolve the smallest of clam spat. Um, that means in three years, when harvesters go to harvest what would have been clams, they won't be there. It's a very short turnaround time. And this, and this is ocean and coastal acidification. It's driven by carbon and the evil twins, NOx and SOx. So reductions in those are really important. And uh, without them, there's going to be untold human cost and economic cost. Uh, Nick uh, concentrated on lobsters, and I want to tell you about clams. Those are the two bases of our coastal economy. And any, any hit to those going to have a huge ripple effect from the coast back. And I feel for those coastal families who are trying to, the fishermen are trying to support their families. And then that money that ripples, you know, right, we say in Portland, up the hill, up to Congress Street. Uh, so any reductions in those gases are going to help. This research has not been duplicated elsewhere yet. Uh, we don't know of any place in New England or the country that is doing this kind of research. And it's shocking to go out and find these pH levels caused by acidification. And I think that as uh, that research gets out more and more people do it in different places, this is going to increase the numbers EPA can use for cost and benefits, uh, because it's a big deal. Uh, the other, I would echo, 
the previous comments about uh, we would prefer an even stronger rule, but we think this is a reasonable rule. Reasonable mean, meaning it's not really open to negotiation. Mm -hmm. So when there's pushback, uh, please call on the environmental community in Maine to help out because we'd be glad to do that. My name is Tony Grassi. I'm from Camden. Um, and I want to commend the EPA for this work. Uh, in my mind, climate change is the existential threat for our species, and um, it's almost impossible to do enough at this stage. Um, and I have a question for you, and that is, if Congress were able to get their minds around a carbon tax, um, wouldn't that be a response to all those who don't want to see increased regulation. In other words, a carbon tax in a way would force all these same things at a much lower cost than a regulatory regime. <laughs> Is there, am I right about that? And in fact, if you, in a congressional negotiation, could you trade the regulatory regime for a steep carbon tax, which essentially would not only solve the problem uh, as relates to standing facilities, but also would get to the transportation issue and all the other sources. As the president has said many times, he's acting on this and other matters. Congress won't. Because Congress won't. So if Congress wanted to act on a climate bill that does, as you suggest, um, I'm sure the president would welcome that interest from Congress in doing that. This is a action we can do with the tool we have, which is the Clean Air Act. Um, as my boss is, reminds me all the time when I start to stray, um, EPA is empowered to implement these statutes. That's what we're geared to do. And we're prepared to do that, thanks to smart people like Shih Tzu who can help us figure this out. Um, we're, we're doing that under the authorities of the Clean Air Act. If Congress wanted to pass a climate bill that um, perhaps has a more efficient way to do it, I'm not going to speak to the specifics because that would probably get me in trouble. Um, I'm sure the administration would welcome that. I, I make the comment only because Lisa told me that these tapes are going to go to both of our senators, and I want them to stand up and be counted and advocate a carbon tax, because I think in the long run, that is the only solution to this problem that's viable, and uh, we're going to get litigated to death over regulatory approaches, and that's, that's my big worry. My name is Norman Reef. The uh, EPA has told us what they propose to do. Previous speakers have told us why it's necessary to do it. I'd like to make a comment on how we do it. The best way to <clears throat> reduce carbon emissions is to not produce them. I was with uh, Senators Muskie and Mitchell, who were at a time when Congress could act, could get their act together, and they were responsible <clears throat> for the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. I'm now <clears throat> with a company here in Portland, Maine, Maine Micro Furnace. And we have developed and patented a micro furnace that will burn any organic material as its fuel without emitting carbon dioxide nor air derived <clears throat> nitrogen oxide. We can work with power plants. We can't replace their boilers, but we can work with the power plant in conjunction with our furnace to reduce the emissions of their carbon dioxide. <clears throat> Not only would this be good for the power plants, but <clears throat> we, <clears throat> we can use the furnace to produce combined power heaters heat and power for hotels, shopping centers, factories, business parks, <clears throat> and do it at a reduced cost for the energy and at the same time not emit the carbon dioxide, not the air-derived nitrogen oxide. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I might add. <clears throat> that we would be looking, uh, we, we have developed this, 
and we have a working model so that the technology is proven. And we would like to work with EPA on a discretionary grant to bring this to the next step. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Gross. <clears throat> I live in Cape Elizabeth, and uh, I have a degree in engineering science from, many, from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute from many, many years ago. And, and I think the EPA has done a lot of terrific things, but I think you've made a terrible, terrible mistake by trying to label carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as a pollutant. I have a couple reasons why I'm, I think this is a mistake. I, uh, every week, I go down to Hannaford, a local, uh, it's a, a grocery store, local grocery store here in Maine. I go down to Hannaford and buy tomatoes all year long, except, except about this time of year when I get tomatoes in my own garden. But I go down and buy tomatoes from Backyard Gardens. Mm -hmm. Now, Backyard Gardens is a giant uh, greenhouse up in Madison, Maine, and they grow the tomatoes all year round inside, the, inside their greenhouse. And I sent an email to them. I had read that the, uh, that, uh, the gentleman here said the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now has gone up from, to uh, about, it's about 390 to 400 parts per million, which is much higher than it's ever been in, in the last uh, uh, 10,000 years. And I had read that, that the uh, greenhouses actually pipe in carbon dioxide. I saw in the, an article in the Portland Press Herald, they, they showed when, when uh, Backyard Gardens first opened up, they showed a pipe labeled CO2 over it. So I sent an email a couple of months ago to Backyard Gardens, and I asked them, Are you really, do you really pump carbon dioxide into your greenhouse? And, and I got one back, and yes, they do. They pump CO2 in there because 400 parts per million is not high enough to really get good tomatoes to grow really well. They pump CO2 in in order to get the, the carbon dioxide to 600 parts per million. And so here's my problem as an engineer. Mr. Spaulding, Ms. Wong, you're telling me that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a pollutant. Backyard Gardens is telling me we need more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to make the make plants grow better. That means my tomatoes and my garden and my backyard are growing, would grow better if the carbon dioxide were higher than 400 parts per million. How can it be a pollutant? So, was that purely a rhetorical point? <laughs> um, well, cow manure in your, in your stream um, isn't, is a pollutant, um, but on your garden it works really well to grow tomatoes. So maybe that's analogous? Maybe that helps you somehow. Um, so uh, my name's Ken Hotop, and I'm from Newry, um, where we have a big downhill ski slope and Nordic skiing, snowshoeing, and uh, some people catch trout, which like cold water. Um, so I just fish for them. I don't catch them. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad to see you here. Thanks for uh, coming, Kurt. And thank you, uh, Lisa. I saw you on the, in the photos on the front page in South Portland. It was good to see you out there um, doing, doing some real good. Um, so um, I, uh, I really am uh, happy about these rules. Um, I, I'm, I'm pleased, tickled, and, uh, and they're not enough. <laughs> I, I would really endorse a 35% cut uh, more um, if it's technologically possible, and, I'm, I'm, and it probably is. Um, so, uh, so we're going too slowly. We need to cut uh, more deeply. Um, but I am, I am very happy, and it's a great step uh, in the right direction. And I also um, really like uh, the work that Kurt has done. I did have one, I have one little picky and criticism, uh, sort of for fun. But that is, um, uh, so when uh, talking about the new climate rules, um, you know, the administration's kind of behind. Um, they should have, you know, started on this stuff years ago. So probably not good to say the president wants to do it because of his legacy. Um, that, I mean, we've got a lot to do to save people and our, our agricultural and fisheries productivity and, and you know, all these, these big and important things, our cities and, and coasts from flooding. So um, he could say that. He could, you could say um, the president is a dad. You know, so he's really concerned about his kids. That would really, for me, that would really strike home. So, but, you know, minor criticism. Um, and I'm not a PR person, obviously. Uh, but, so, um, I have a small environmental consulting company, and I actually work in the uh, coal mining regions of Appalachia at times. And some of the best people I work with are 
down there. They, they live there and work there. And um, I am very, um, I very much like them. I respect them a great deal. Uh, uh, they work very hard. Um, and they have some real economic challenges as well. They have a lot of limitations on what they can do. And, um, but I also know that, um, you know, being respectful to them means giving them the straight, you know, the, the straight answers and, and saying right to their faces, your jobs, they're important, but they're not as important as our jobs in fisheries and agriculture and tourism across Maine and the whole country and the whole planet. They, they can't be. And they're, they're not as important as people's towns. And they just cannot be as important as people's lives. And I think they understand that. They already know it, I think. But um, if EPA can deliver that to them, you know, respectfully, and, and, and I really like these rules because they, the, they try and ease some of these uh, coal-burning states into uh, emissions cuts. Um, I think that's great, but um, again, push hard and, and don't back down and go to 35% if we, if we possibly can. Um, we are short on time. And the last thing I'd like to say is the administration needs to be consistent in its uh, addressing uh, global uh, warming. We need to also be stopping the Keystone XL pipeline. We need to be uh, dealing with uh, coal reserves on public lands in the West, you know, cutting back on those. Uh, exploitation of those coal beds. So we need to be consistent across the board and act like, the administration needs to act like it cares about climate change in every case, not just when we're talking about carbon dioxide rules. Um, Peg Dilly, town of Casco, Maine. We're the second largest lake regions of, of this area. We provide the drinking water for the most of southern Maine, right out of my backyard. Um, I'm also past I'm on the Energy Committee in my town, past director of Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association Certification Program. I have been on the steering committee that formed the Common Ground Country Fair. So I've been very involved in what's been going on in the state since the early 70s and hung out with Scott Nearing and a lot of the old gurus of our time. What, and I'm so glad that our country as a whole is looking into this issue. What if we were to help some of these, pro these towns and cities with tax incentive programs. Um, solar funding could be available for communities in town to change to solo geo wind. There's nothing right now, or tidal, or river and ocean. This would give them some incentives to do that. Um, having solars change to solar lights throughout our country, that could save a lot of carbon going out. Those solar panels on top of those lights are exposed because Mostly there's not trees there. They don't want them knocked down. That could be putting energy back in. Little trickles by little trickles. You know what they say, one penny makes, you know, five pennies make a nickel. One nick, two nickels make a dime. You know, so I mean it will create things little by little. Uh, as a dog owner and a dog animal and trainer, I have found that some dogs will work for just the joy, just like some communities. Others need a to motivate them. They don't like change, but if, if it's rewarded, at least they'll try. And uh, it's amazing how much animals and human beings are the same. They are the same in their need for clean air, water, and soil. Um, and not all plants grow the same. Some needs more CO and some need less. You can see that some, it, the ivies that grow in the cities are taking off the cities. There is milfoil that is growing because of that. And I don't know about anybody else, but I'd like to be able to swim without having to go slush, slush, slush and not be able to swim because there's so much of these algae plants that are now growing. Um, all farmers know that unhealthy in any of these areas with the soil, the air, or the water means unhealthy plants, means un and they're not nutritious to eat, which is why, thank God, we're all thinking organic. It used to be, there was, we had to go to the Federation of Cooperatives in our state, everybody get together with their little scale, and everybody would buy five pounds of this and that because you didn't sell them to grocery stores. We're seeing that change. It's slow. The pendulum always swings one way before it swings back, and then it gradually, it's back in the middle. Um, 
high water, does, as this lady here pointed out, does not just affect the culverts. It also affects things like the pipelines that run in our country. These pipelines are old, and when the water comes under, it doesn't just wash the culverts out, it also pushes up the pipelines. I see this when I ride the horses on the pipelines after heavy rains. I go out and ride. There's a section of pipeline there, a section of pipeline there. We give calls out so they can come in and re-put them under. So it just is not just affecting one thing. And if any of these things change, then we're going to have another type of pollutant that's going out there. We saw this in New Jersey when the whole city went. And a lot of us that had listened to Al Gore years and years ago, we all said, Al Gore's prediction, it's coming up, you know. And I said to my brother in Seattle, he said, are you okay? I said, yep, but Scotty's going to get hit down in Stonington, Connecticut more than me. And you watch what happens to the sea. And it has. You know, the mother got a little angry at what we're doing to her. Okay. This has caused mudslides and landfills. And we're seeing this in the news. Fire danger areas, Washington State, Florida, where the land and the fracking underground from exploring for all these different products that we seem to think we need. And all I can think of is the practice of a chisel plow. What a chisel plow does, it goes around and around and around and it aerates the soil. Well, we're aerating the mother when we're going down that deep. And after a while, with the chisel plow, the land starts to settle back down. Well, we're seeing areas where the fracking's going on and the earth is packing back down. So we're going to be causing these landfills. We're going to be causing these sinkholes by our practices. So much depends on your plans for the United States' future. Because the future that the ER you know, your, pro your program here comes up with is going to affect all of our futures. So, you know, try to reward some of these little towns and cities to get the incentive going because you'll find a lot of them will do it because, you know, just like dogs, some need rewards and some work for their pay. Hi, uh, my name is Barry Woods. Uh, I'm an attorney with Drummond and Drummond, but uh, more importantly, I'm uh, a director for Plug in America, which is one of the leading consumer... Uh, advocacy groups prom promoting vehicle electrification. Uh, I actually came to listen today, I won't, so I won't talk very long, and I didn't really have any prepared remarks, but one of the things that I want to thank NRCM for hosting this and, and Administrator Spaulding for taking time to, to come and listen. Um, and, I, and one of the things that I want to just mention uh, from your slide deck when I saw your, your donut and in thinking about the areas that I've been involved in uh, uh, was the, the intersection between electricity and transportation, both of which contribute tremendously to the CO2 uh, emission. And uh, recently, I, I recently lived in Oregon where I've seen the, you know, the beginning advent of uh, this transformation where there's now about 600 public charging stations and the adoption rate of electric vehicles in the West Coast is, is accelerating, as it is nationally. And I think this year we're looking at about 250,000 total vehicle sales in the United States, which is um, phenomenal, and it's at about twice the rate of hybrids. So in looking at electricity and in looking at how it's intersecting, and it's going to increasingly intersect with the transportation sector, um, the idea that the grid is going to be getting cleaner, um, and I, I don't know if this was an intended consequence. I'd, I'd like to think that it was. Um, it's going to have tremendous leverage on the transportation emission sector. Um, and I want to applaud you for focusing on, obviously, you know, the, the critical low-hanging fruit when it comes to emission, but also to, to point out that we are going to be seeing, I think, as a society, and, and recently we, I've been involved with Central Maine Power here in developing charge, some public charging stations. So it's happening in Maine, and it's happening throughout New England and Massachusetts and so forth. So I think we are seeing a transformation that's going to fit very neatly within your efforts to, to reduce carbon emission, and, uh, and it will cut out that whole, well, hopefully at some point, maybe within 10 years, maybe within 20, hopefully within 10, I mean, it'll dramatically reduce the level of emission that we see occurring in the transportation sector as well. So I want to thank you for that and point out that that, that the line is blurring and uh, appreciate your efforts. I'm Kimberly Richards. I am from Elliott and I'm the founder of Citizens for Clean Air. Um, I applaud the EPA for taking steps toward cleaner power. However, my concern is that attention may be diverted from other ongoing and pressing issues. Plans for the future are crucial but so too are actions we're taking right now. 
The town of Elliott has submitted a petition to the EPA under Section 126 of the Clean Air Act asking for help to resolve our air pollution problem that we've long suspected the neighboring New Hampshire coal burning Schiller station as being the source. The EPA has already granted itself two extensions when the deadline for a response neared. Recently, representatives from the EPA have been scouting possible locations in Elliott for a temporary monitor. This sounds well and good, but unfortunately it pushes us back to about 2017 in terms of getting any real answers to our decades-long concerns. Citizens of Elliott have been more than patient. Now they are asking me why we haven't heard from the EPA about our petition. So I'm asking you now, respectfully, on behalf of Citizens for Clean Air and the rest of the citizens of Elliott, will the EPA investigate Elliott's air pollution in accordance with Section 126 of the Clean Air Act? And when can we expect a proper response to our call for help? Finally, what steps will the EPA take to ensure adherence to new and more stringent standards? If power plants aren't being held accountable for, no, for our non-compliance with current regulations, how can we expect them to adhere to even stricter standards as those that are presently proposed? Thank you. Am I? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Tom Peterson. I'm from Windham, Maine, and for the last 36 years, I've been researching, designing, building, and promoting energy efficient housing. And uh, I want to thank all the speakers before me uh, because I agree with everything they say by bar one. Uh, 600 parts uh, per million of uh, CO2 may be great for tomatoes, but I don't think the rest of the human race would very, do very well with that. And I had to say that, I'm sorry. Uh, the one thing uh, I want to talk uh, to the EPA about, uh, and again, I have no particular product to sell you, uh, but I have a, uh, a perspective to try to sell you. And you touched upon it earlier, clip it, correct? Kurt. 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 Okay, you touched upon it when you said you're also looking at working on the energy uh, efficiency use. And that's the one thing that I think, you know, your proposal on the generation efficiency is great. Uh, I highly applaud everything that's been done in that area. I think I agree with the 35% uh, number that was mentioned by a couple people. Uh, there's nothing wrong with aiming for higher standards. Uh, but we can turn around and cut our, uh, our energy use. And I'm talking about everyone here in this room can help with this. Uh, your donut chart, I thought, felt was a little bit uh, a misperception because I've seen you know, dozens of charts that show end energy use that our residential and commercial buildings, supermarkets, that they consume 40% of the energy uh, used in this country. Okay, and in your chat, the way it was presented, uh, again, from a certain perspective, which is appropriate, uh, but it, it made it look like that was only worth, uh, you know, 10 percent and that, you know, any efforts there weren't valuable. I'm saying those efforts are highly valuable. They're four times more uh, than what that chat indicated. Okay, but again, your perspective was correct. Uh, you know, that electricity generation, it creates a pollution. We're all using that. So we're demanding that pollution. Uh, by using that energy. Um, and the, uh, the thing is that uh, overall, 40% of our energy is used uh, for our residential commercial buildings. We can turn around and with the technology that's available today that is the average carpet that can do it, uh, we could cut that energy need by, 40, by 50% and cut total U.S. energy use by 20%. And that's something I think that the EPA needs to look at. My name is Seabury Lyon. I live in Bethel. I grew up on a dirt patch farm, and I spent uh, 36 years escaping that uh, fate in uh, engineering. And uh, I have an engineering background. <coughs> and until this meeting, I have <coughs> never heard more tomatoes faster as an item of concern. And I ask us all to consider that we may be suffering collectively a failure of imagination. And I'm saying that because I haven't really heard any mention yet uh, uh, of a methane or methane, depending mm -hmm. on where you're from, avalanche, which an increase in CO2 is going to eventuate. And I'm really concerned that unless we get the real picture, as Ken Hotop very well uh, pointed out, 
they've got to be able to visualize what their existence is in the, those Kentucky hills, those uh, Appalachian hills. And all of us have to be able to visualize what's going to happen if we do not act. An increase in CO2 beyond a certain point eventuates an avalanche of methane, which has orders of magnitude more potential greenhouse gas potential. Really important concept. If we can relate that to our otherwise mundane existences, perhaps, um, maybe we can, we can draw a picture that people can respond to, get emotionally involved in. Al Gore was right. He was a little bit early in terms of the maturity of the population to register what he was saying, unfortunately. Timing is everything, right? <laughs> we have just a little bit of time left, and we damn well better move fast. My good neighbor and fellow gardener, Mr. Gross. Hi, Tony. <laughs> well, we've been respectful neighbors for over 35 years, and uh, I guess, uh, unlike Congress, we can agree to disagree politely. Um, <laughs> But he's given me the opportunity to address a couple of his issues. Uh, my background is as a scientist also. I'm a physician at Maine Medical Center in the emergency department. And every day I deal with an equation which I bore medical students and residents with called the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, which <coughs> describes the relationship between carbon dioxide and pH. And it's fundamental to the practice of medicine because pH in our bodies is important as it is in the environment. Um, it made me think, well, how can I answer Bill's question about carbon dioxide not being a pollutant? And there's many chemicals in our body where too little or too much is bad. And one that we're all familiar with, we eat every day potassium. We get it in bananas and orange juice. If you have too little potassium, it can be lethal. Too much potassium kills people every day who have renal disease and can't process it well. So there's lots of examples of chemicals in the environment where too much or too little is bad, and there is a sweet spot. We know what that is, between three and a half and five milligrams uh, in our bodies, and we know where the sweet spot is for carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, so I don't know if that helps, Bill. We'll continue this over our gardens <laughs> as, as we compare our tomatoes. And I've, I've beat him in asparagus, but he's probably got earlier tomatoes than I do. <laughs> um, since I'm speaking off the cuff, I just want to, since I am a physician, I wanted to focus on the health aspects, my, per my perception of this. You heard it from Lonnie Graham. I worked my shift in the ED yesterday, admitted three people with respiratory, disease, respiratory problems, an asthmatic, a COPD patient, and a young woman with cystic fibrosis, all who felt, why, why are you sicker today? The air is bad. These are people telling me this. My, I have five grandchildren now, and uh, I've spent the last 10 days with them. I'm exhausted, but one of them is asthmatic, and she's been admitted three times to Children's Hospital in Boston, presumably for air quality and allergens, other things. So uh, I really encourage you to move ahead, move more strongly if you can, this is important. I see the effects every day. They're happening a half a mile from here at Maine Medical Center as I speak. And uh, I thank you for what you've done, and I hope you can do more. My name is Sue Jones, um, and I, am a, I own Community Energy Partners, which is located in Freeport, Maine, which is a community energy, renewable, renewable energy uh, uh, project developer. I formerly worked at the Natural Resources Council of Maine as the Energy Project Director, and I'm thrilled to see a, a lifetime of advocacy from so many people here in the audience today come to fruition. This is a great step forward. But let's face it, the work's not done. And Kurt, we know and we trust that your leadership is going to be critical. In Maine, we bear the impacts of downwind air pollution every single day, whether it's health, uh, Casco Bay, our economy. No one mentioned acid rain today. Very little was talked about with mercury. We have mercury advisories on every single major lake in the state of Maine. We can't eat the fish here. You know that. We know that. But let's, let's keep the pressure on. We know the Ohio River Valley. We know Appalachia is going to be fighting this hard at every step of the way dragging their feet. They're not, those states are not going to put in their action plans. Let's make and keep New England at the top of its game. We did the work 10 years ago. We've shown Reggie is cost effective. We are the best examples, probably aside or in addition to California. Let's work together. And, and hopefully we ask you to keep the pressure on, 
in your official capacity to work with the other regions so that we don't have any lallygaggers um, in the United States, but that we're really working lockstep towards the future. So thank you.